Last Monday, we published a video on the Senenmut is Moses theory. And that raised a lot of issues. So on this Man of Machine Alert, we're going to go deep into the rabbit hole. We're going to discuss some of the issues raised by that video and discuss some of the new things we've discovered concerning that theory. So hang on to your hats because this is going to be a wild one on this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. I have here, as part of my managed machine alert, my producer, Kiara. Hello. She's raised some issues. I found some more issues since we originally published the video. And we are going to talk about them today. Okay. Before we get into any of the little details here, let's talk about who we're talking about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are talking about the author of a series of articles and who was interviewed by the Armstrong Institute, an author by the name of Christopher Eames. Okay. He's a staff writer for Let the Stone Speak, which is, a, which is a popular press magazine that's published by the Armstrong Institute. It is not peer-reviewed. It's not peer-reviewed. Okay. Now, Christopher Eames has no formal training in archaeology as I can tell. He is a popularizer, and that's fine. We need popularizers. Popularizers serve an important function. Popularizers basically do something scholars are really not very good at. Scholars are trained to not speak their voice. They're trained to give the dry, basic facts in as short a form as possible. The scholars don't have a lot of time to read and listen. Yeah. Now, the purpose of a popularizer, and I, and I think they do serve a very valid purpose, so this is not a criticism, is to pick and choose and then promote the ideas that they think are interesting. And I think that that can serve a very valuable function. Now, Christopher Eames is not the only popularizer out there. There's lots of them. You get people who do this privately, who aren't connect, who don't do this for a living. But you also got like out media outlets like Science News, who basically send representatives to say academic conferences looking for papers to to publicize and to to popularize. So it's something that is a common part of the academic process. Now, the problem with popularizing is popularizers can sometimes be confused for subject matter experts. The big name in this particular case is Bill Nye, the science guy. Bill Nye is not a scientist. He holds a degree in a bachelor's degree in engineering, but he's really an actor. A friend of ours sent over a meme of the fact that the actor in Rocky who played the Russian boxer actually has fabulous science degrees and he's so much more of a real scientist than bill nye the actor guy and yet we think bill nye is the science expert and the russian boxer is just an actor yeah so the thing with being a popularizer is you have to be cautious you should be you should be cautious but being cautious doesn't make a good story. Being a sensationalist makes a great story. The, the Achilles heel of popularizers is sometimes they can throw caution to the wind. And I think that's what's happened here with the series of articles and videos we are about to talk about here. And frankly, when we started looking at this, we just looked at the one article. It was the one article that initially came to our attention. Is this Moses? which was his article talking about Sendenmut being the biblical Moses. And had enough problems that it made its own Monday video. Yeah, it had enough problems. Indeed, it had enough problems that it made its own Monday video. But we soon found out that this wasn't just one article. This was a series of related articles and videos. 
And he does make that reference himself. Yeah. Both in the articles and a lot in the videos. And to his credit, he's not trying to cite himself necessarily. He's just saying, see XYZ for more details. Yeah. So we found out there are a lot more details that needed to be covered. Now, I think when we talk about him, his, his approach to things, all, everything we're going to talk about today is going to fall under sort of two categories, two general criticisms. One is confirmation bias. He's got a theory. He's going to cherry pick the supporting data, but ignore the data that goes against him. Okay? So he will, he will end up at the wrong conclusion because his bias is going to take him to where he wants it to go. I would like to point out what the bias is. All right, go for it. On page 28 of his article, he is talking about Sedent Moot's sudden disapp disappearance. And he says, quote, The lack of solid archaeological and textual evidence allowing the vivid imagination of Sedent Moot scholars to run wild and resulting in a variety of fervently held solutions, some of which would do credit to any fictional murder mystery plot. So he's fallen in love with the idea, is Sedat Mo Moses, it's a murder mystery. And murder mysteries make great stories. They do. So today we're going to talk about the problems of making a great story that does not necessarily represent factual data. Yeah. Now that's half the problem. Okay. That's that's the big one of the big umbrella criticisms I have. The other big umbrella criticism is his sources. He's got some very very poor sources. Now, when we raised these issues in the first video, we were our video was criticized on two grounds. The first ground was essentially uh, we were accused of doing ad hominem attacks on Eames through his sources the so-called genetic fallacy and the straw and, and basically the yeah, second was a straw man okay now we'll we'll engage the straw man first but let's talk about that genetic fallacy because we had raised the issue that antonio crasto was a fish biologist which he is There's no question about that and it had been raised that we had said that we shouldn't pay attention to eames because his sources were, one of his sources was a fish biologist. Now, I think one of the problems here is people don't understand what a genetic fallacy is. A genetic fallacy is when you say, oh, ignore this person because the source is such and such, and that's your only criticism of it. You had the thing with the difference between, say, a proper critique of sources and a genetic fallacy is with a proper critique of sources, you are both critiquing the content and the source not just the source. So I think this is a very important difference to lay out here. As soon as you start engaging the ideas, it's no longer a genetic fallacy. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot, some of our viewers did not have that, say, attention span to understand that. So, you know, once, you, once we started going into the content, it ceased being a genetic fallacy. But we also want to, to raise the, the issue, too, of that evaluating sources is part of this. That's basically what you do in graduate level mm -hmm. college. Everybody thinks, oh, getting a bachelor's degree is high school plus. It's not. It's a whole never, another level. But then people also assume once they have their bachelor's, a master's degree is just a bachelor's plus. And it's not. It's a whole nother level. Yeah. One of the jobs of an academic a scholar is to evaluate your sources. And there's, there's many ways a source can fail to be good. It can be obsolete. It can have old research that's out of date. Valid research for its time. Valid research for its time. But now new discoveries have shown it to be out of date. It can be a low quality source from an author that doesn't know what they're doing. It can be an author, uh, part of that low-quality source can be that 
that author doesn't cite his sources. So he's just making it up a whole cloth. That's a low quality source. It can also be an irrelevant source, a source from somebody else that doesn't really apply to the subject matter you're talking about. You can even have sources that are from, from essentially fringe um, theorists that are just so out in left field that they don't represent the view you are trying to, to champion. And with a lot of fringe sources, what they're doing now with social media is finding each other so they can give you 10 sources that cite what they're saying. They can represent themselves as the consensus view. I mean, it's even become a trope in certain yes. movies. Like you'll see in, in movies like Stargate. You know, why is this guy still using Budge? Okay. If, you're, if, if you've done Egyptology classes for any length of time, you understand that trope. My first paper for James Hoffmeyer, I used Budge because that's who we had in the library. I got taught to. <laughs> yes, you did. I don't use Budge anymore. No, and nobody should use Budge anymore. But I didn't know. Nobody, I mean, unless you've gone through the academic process, you wouldn't know. Unless you happen to be a big movie file. <laughs> watch Stargate. <laughs> but a lot of people who saw that didn't understand. Yeah, a lot of people who saw it didn't understand that. You and I laughed like crazy. Yeah, we, we thought it was funny because we understood the trope. Yeah. We understood why Budge is such a bad source. Yeah. Okay? So evaluating sources is an important part of the academic process. It's a skill that's developed. Yeah, it's a skill that's developed. It's also that it's evidence. Yes. When a writer writes, he's not just writing his ideas out. He's backing it up, connecting it to the real world with evidence. That evidence is his sources. So if you've got a fish biologist who is one of your sources, that could be an indication of a low-quality source. So the whole genetic fallacy thing doesn't bear water. Now... The straw man is a little more interesting and more complicated. Because uh, when we did the original Sunenmut video, as I said before, we based it on the printed article. We hadn't realized that most people who are coming in and watching our video actually knew about this not through the article, but through the video. And also they knew about the other yeah, videos and articles, which, which are associated with it. Yeah, yeah, because we rarely read. Yeah, popular level material. Yeah. we tend to read academic sources. Yeah, we weren't aware of that. Yeah, we weren't aware of that that other content that was out there. Now, now we are. Now we are, which is why we're doing this, Madam Machine Alert. Is we are going to go into that content in great detail. And just for anyone who's not familiar with this channel, David is a subject matter expert. It should not need to be said, but since we're addressing it and we get these comments, David does have a PhD in Egyptology. It's like being a psychiatrist. You can be interested in psychology all you want, but unless you have that credential, you're not a psychiatrist. So unless you have that PhD in Egyptology, you are not an Egyptologist. Dr. Falk is an Egyptologist. Now, suffice it to say, we weren't straw manning him, but we were representing his views as they were in the article. Now that we have the greater exposure, we can understand, though, how some people might have thought we were sub straw manning because the two arguments are materially different. The video has content that's materially different from the article. Yes. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go deep, deep now into the content of those videos and articles. Now, 
everything in his it is this Moses article and video is based upon a previous set of articles and videos, which is the who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus, which was published last year. So now he has he built his entire case on Senenut based on the date of the Exodus. And he's utterly reliant on the high chronology. Yeah, and that's the first thing that we're going to get to, is we're going to just go through his, his argument here on who is the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Because he makes some, some critical mistakes here that I think are basically need to be addressed. For example, he presumes a universal acceptance of the high chronology. And when we talk about the whole idea of, like, for example, he also states that you don't need to adjust Egyptian chronology nor biblical chronology, but then he does something very odd, which is he uses a very idiosyncratic fringe chronology. So he basically, what we discovered, is he adjusts both the biblical <laughs> and the Egyptian <laughs> When you get down to the nuts and bolts. Yeah, yeah. And this is, this is what I think is, is really sort of interesting about that, is, he, is he, he keeps using the word standard high chronology. But then you find out what he means by standard high chronology. I do not think that word means what you think it means. Yeah, this is on his Who Was the Pharaoh of the Exodus article, page 12. Dating specifics. Pharaohs of the Exodus. Yes. And I've got it highlighted here. Okay. But one of the interesting things is, I'm, and I know a lot about the history of chronology. Actually, the last word was cut off. It's pharaohs of the 18th dynasty. My bad. Sorry? <laughs> On the back of the page. Uh, one of the things is he copies here, the, the chronology he copies here is not the standard chronology. This is the Douglas Petrovich chronology. Of which he says Douglas, Professor Douglas Petrovich agrees. Yeah. Yeah. This is Douglas Petrovich's chronology. Yeah. You've said in conversation that this appears in only one place. Yeah. This, all, this only appears in the works of Douglas Petrovich. You're not going to find this chronology elsewhere. Not as a rule. Now, there's some people who will adopt his chronology. But that's not the standard high chronology. Like, for example, the, he puts the reign of Amenhotep II at 1453 to 1426 BC. That's a Petrovich chronology. The, well, what chronologists mean when they say standard high chronology puts Amenhotep II at 1439 to 1413. That is a difference of 13 years. And when we talk about uh, New Kingdom chronology, that's a big amount. That's a big amount. Most of these chronologies are not wiggling like that to that extent. Well, you look at the difference culturally between 1950s America versus the 1960s. Yeah. you think you were on a different planet. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, when you look at, say, chronology, it's like, okay, he tells you this, that, that he's using a standard chronology, standard high chronology, over and over and over again, and then he baits and switches you. He baits you with the standard high chronology and then switches to that Petrovich chronology. And I think that's either very poor research or it's just a matter of convenience. It's just how to make a good story technique. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to... People who sit in the pew are going to say, oh, standard chronology, okay. Yeah. And they're going to put that in a level of credibility. Yeah. If you say, this is the chronology of somebody who he's pretty much the only one who holds this. Mm -hmm. He's got a few followers, but this is not academically standard. Mm -hmm. They're going to be much less likely to listen to the story. Yeah. Even with that, even with their sort of clinging to that that standard uh what they call the standard high chronology they will only use it as far as it is convenient and this is this is one of the things is there's an inconsistency here 
like, for example, according to the Petrovich chronology, okay, first of all, we know that Hatshetsu died around age 50. Okay, we know that. And we know we rule, she ruled 21 years. Okay? So these are the known facts about Queen Hatshetsut. This creates a really difficult problem if, according to them, and they're reading the numbers literally, they are they're using a hermeneutical method, which we would call Western numerical primacy. Okay, now let me tease that out. It's a Western reading of the texts. This is not an Eastern reading. This is not reading these texts according to the ancient Near Eastern context. This is taking our Western views of science and engineering. In the vernacular, we love our numbers. We love our numbers, yes, yes. Math is God. <laughs> Math is God, yes. And we're using that as our primary means to, to interpret the texts. So we, we, we place numbers above words. Now, the Israelites didn't do that. They placed, say, other texts above their numbers, which is why numbers are so frequently found changed in the biblical texts. Numbers are much more general. Yeah, they're much more given to, to tweaking and fluidity and basically changes by editors. These idioms that we get into of, you know, this is a perfect number, like we'd say it was 100 years ago. Yeah. It conveys the meaning of this was a different century. Yeah, and basically what Eames is going to say is you have to start with numbers when you interpret the biblical text. He is very clear. Yeah, he's very clear about His this. His entire argument is based on biblical numbers. Mm -hmm. Even though, as you started out saying, he does say you don't have to adjust the Egyptian chronology and you don't have to adjust the biblical chronology. He starts his entire argument within the framework mm -hmm. and he states it emphatically. This is biblical numbers by which he means a literal interpretation. Yeah. If you get into the philosophy of idiomatic numbers, cultural meanings, mm -hmm. this whole argument, all the articles and variations of it fall apart. Yeah, all this falls apart if you take this stuff according to its cultural context, not according to a Western, literal, engineering view of numbers. So this is basically a cage match. Pretty much, yeah. Western versus Eastern understanding. It is. It is very much a Western versus Eastern understanding of the biblical texts. And he's taking a very Western approach to this. Uh, he's, he's even said as much as the three 40s that make up the 120 years of Moses are literal 40s. I was so disappointed when I found out those weren't literally 40 years, 40 years, 40 years. Yeah. Because I thought this proved God did history my way. Mm -hmm. This was God because it was history with neat, tidy numbers. Yes. I was so disappointed <laughs> to find out this wasn't true. Well, here's the thing. It gets them into a bind at some point. This is, and, and for example, if you follow their chronology as well as the age of Hapshetsu, that when she died, as well as how long she reigned, as well as that literal reading of that 40 years of Moses, you know, 40, 40, 40, Moses will be born in 1526, would have been born in 1526 B.C. Hapshetsu would have been born in 1533 B.C., making her seven years old at the time she adopted Moses, who was three months old at the time. And he gets into this because he realizes that's he gives the standard chronology as giving her the age of 10. So he comes up with a second person who names 12. And then he quotes Petrovich, who gives her the age of 15. Quoting, quoting here from the page 25 of the Moses article. Quote, apply standard high chronology dates, which he doesn't do. Abshetsu was about 10 years old at the time of biblical Moses' discovery. Petrovich puts her at 12 years old. 
and applying Crastus chronology to our dates for Moses and the Exodus would make her around 15 years old, end quote. So what we have here is a bunch of guys using Petrovich's chronology until it isn't convenient anymore. Because if you really used Petrovich's chronology and the literal readings of the 40, 40, 40, 40 of Moses, Epshetsut would be seven. And that's not going to be very savory because she would not have been in a position to adopt. Okay. Yeah, Petrovich put her at 12. Yeah, Petrovich doesn't yeah. even follow his own chronology here. This is where the fish doctor came in. Yep. The fish expert came in. Yep, Crasto is the fish expert. He's the one who made her 15 years old. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not going by the chronology. They say they're going by. They're dumping it as soon as it's inconvenient. Yeah. So that's a... Seven-year-old female would not be able to adopt. Yeah, exactly. Seven-year-old female would have no agency to adopt. Petrovich makes it credible at age 12. The fish expert makes it palatable to Westerners. Yeah. 15-year-old adopt. Yeah. But these are not... These are not... S standard high chronology dates. Not at all. Not at all. This is, this is, this is, they're throwing it out as soon as it becomes inconvenient. So, you know, once you've got them contradicting themselves on the chronology, that's a bad, bad start. Bad start. Again, he based his whole claim that you don't have to make any adjustments to the biblical chronology and you don't have to make adjustments to the Egyptian chronology. Yeah. Now, Eames doesn't end there. That's just his beginning of his early Exodus argument. He makes the three classic arguments for the early Exodus date, which is the 1st Kings 6 1 and the 480th year there. Uh, we have already discussed all three of these in previous videos, so we're not going to go into deep detail here. But that 480 years is a temple dedication inscription. We find lots of these in the ancient Near East. None of them use literal dates. It's all idiomatic, symbolic, numerological numbers. So not good evidence there. He then uses Judges 11, which basically has Jephthah sending a letter to the king of Ammon, saying, in 300 years, why didn't you reclaim the land? When everything Jephthah says in that letter is wrong, he's a bad witness. The point of that whole point of that letter was to show the reader he's a bad witness. He's a bad judge. He doesn't know his own history. So, would I use this 300 years as anything for ev evidence at all? No. I mean, this. You'd have to be crazy to use this as evidence. Because everything that, that Jephthah says in that letter is wrong. And then he uses the, first, the, the genealogy of Samuel in 1 Chronicles 6. And I've also. Uh, discuss that in great detail where that is a spliced genealogy. That genealogy in First Chronicles 6 shows the posterity of Samuel being descended from the tribe of Levi. But we know from 1 Samuel 1, 1, 1 that Samuel was an Ephraimite from the tribe of Ephraim, from the land of Ephraim. So he's full on Ephraimite. Why did the writer of First Chronicles do this? It's so that Samuel's posterity could be honorarily grafted into the Levites so they could serve in the temple. So all three of those proofs don't hold water. But and this has been discussed in detail if you actually track the argument. Yeah, yeah. But Eames doesn't address any of this. No, no, Eames doesn't address any of the contrary arguments for this or any of the contrary evidence. He just uses the classic proofs and just... Is, is happy with that. He then moves on to the Hapiru. The Hapiru in the Amarna letters. And he basically says the Hapiru equals the Hebrews. He states it as fact. Page 24 of the Is This Moses article. Panicked Canaanite leaders described an invading people referred to as Hapiru. Parentheses, i.e. Hebrews. Close parentheses. 
taking all the land. So this is stated just as given fact, not contested, not most people don't believe this anymore. This is oh, falls into the category of old data. Yeah. Unreliable because it's old data. Yeah. It was a valid theory. Now people understand that word to be completely different. Yeah. And you've gone into detail, but you should flesh it out just a little bit for people who are listening for the first time. Yeah, okay, so for you, those of you who are listening for the first time who don't know about the whole Hapiru Hebrew controversy, it's it's sort of like this. All Hebrews are Hapiru, but not all Hapiru are Hebrews. Now, a Hapiru is, is, a, is a social term. It's a social class term used in the ancient Near East for wanderer, sojourner, mercenary, robber, bum. It's a derogatory term. It's a derogatory term class term. For someone who's not one of us. Yeah. These are people who subsist on the outside of cities. Nomadic people. Mm -hmm. Or on, live on the outskirts, you know, who will rob you, boil you, come in and out of a city. Yeah, that kind of people. There, it's not a good thing to be a Hapiru. Yeah. And we have got references to a Piru going back to the late third millennium. So, and we, we find references to the Hapiru all over the ancient Near East. So there is plenty of evidence yeah. that the Hebrew may have been considered Hapiru, but it doesn't equal Hebrew. Yeah. In fact, there's a very interesting letter from Teru of Urkesh where Teru says to the king of Mari, I have abandoned Urkesh. Now I am a Hapiru. He wasn't before, but now he is. Because now he's a wanderer that's wandering around Syria, trying to live off the land. Someone who's not a solid citizen. No. No. But you know, so, so that's the problem with just equating Hapiru with Hebrew in general. But there's this another problem with the equating the Hapiru of the Amarna letters with the Hebrews, which is where they're located. A lot of the letters, Amarna letters, are from the king of Byblos. The vast majority, the, basically most of the, the number one letter writer, king of, of Byblos, okay? he's basically saying, hey, Akhenaten, send help. I'm, I'm getting attacked by the king of Amuru, the Amorites, who's hired all these Hapiru. Now, this is a real problem when you talk about the Exodus and the conquest of Canaan. Because Biblos is in Lebanon. It's north of the tribal holdings of Dan. The Israelites never ventured that far north. What's being described, and frankly, the Hapiru never the Hebrews, the Israelites, never worked for the Amorites. Mm -hmm. That's a huge problem, too. And this is why scholars take the Amarna letters as a complete refutation against the early Exodus date. Mm -hmm. He's using it as evidence for, yeah. by simply saying, Habiru i.e. Hebrews, and stating in f as emphatic fact. Yeah, it's total confirmation bias. Yeah. You know, he even said in his article on, say, the Amarna letters, that there's no evidence that Biblos was actually conquered by the Hapiru. And again, and yet, a complete article on that. As yeah, well. there's a complete article on that. But even that one, you know, that's, there's this huge confirmation bias there because the king of Biblos has to leave. He has to flee. He has to flee Biblos to escape. You know, a king doesn't, a, a ruler doesn't just run away from an external threat if there's nobody on the doorstep. Not generally. Not generally, no. Usually it's good to be king. It's usually good to be king, yes, exactly. So he has to flee because they're on the doorstep. So there's some serious problems with his identification here. Uh, the fact is, though, that when we look at the Amarna letters, it is talking about something biblical. But it's talking about an event that took place before the Israelite conquest. 
when the Israelites enter into the Promised Land through the Heshbon and the Arnon, they're going north of the Kingdom of Ammon into the territory of the Amorites. These were the lands that the Amorites had conquered. So what we're seeing in the Amarna letters is that conquest of the king of Amaru, king of the Amorites, over that northern Levant. So it's a preface to it's that. A preface to the conquest, the Israelite conquest. But the Amarna letters are not describing the Israelite conquest itself, but the prehistory. Very important distinction. A very important distinction. Different distinction, different actors, different players. So he uses a lot of confirmation bias here, and I think that's a problem. He then goes on, and then he talks about Athenism. You know, this is part of, again, a part of his ar argument, that Athenism resulted from a collapse of Egyptian polytheism, and that would have come after the Exodus. Problem is, there's no evidence of a collapse of the religious system. None. That's empty conjecture. That's just empty conjecture. We have no evidence. In fact, we have all the evidence suggests that polytheism was going strong at the time of Akhenaten's accession. Well, there's a lot of misunderstanding about Akhenaten mm -hmm. because Christians want to say, see, monotheism became the norm. Yeah. It's this evolutionary thought of theology. Yeah. That all religions start out polytheistic. Well, Atheism wasn't even monotheistic. It's well, it's pantheistic. It was basically, from my understanding of it, him trying to make himself supreme. And you explained it very well. Shift the center of power. Yeah, it was very much a, it was basically a, a power shift. It wasn't so much a theological revolution. No, it was a political one. It was a political ploy that was successful. Yeah, it was successful in its own way, yeah. But it was a political ploy to move the power base from Thebes to Amarna, away from the Theban priesthood. Because one of the problems with the Theban priesthood, and a lot of kings experienced this, not just him, was, you know, a king could, could send an edict, and the th priests of Thebes would just ignore it. They would passively, aggressively n ignore it. We had passive-aggressive even back then. Yeah, even back then you had passive aggression, yeah. And the priests of Thebes would just not implement it, would just not do it. So for a guy like Akhenaten, this was very frustrating, incredibly frustrating. So he just created his own priesthood. Yeah, so he just created his own priesthood, his own religion, and basically incorporated all the gods of Egypt into his worship. So all the gods of Egypt, except for the few that were king, because they had to be rubbed out, were part of the Aten, manifestations of the Aten. So Anubis, manifestation of the Aten. The Uraeus, manifestation of the Aten. Even Ray, in some, some cases... Manifestation of the Aten. That is not classical monotheism. Not that classical monotheism. All is Aten. That's pantheism. So, his suggestion here that you had a collapse of the religious system in a monotheism, there's no evidence of that. He then talks about the Shasu of Yahweh. Now, at Soleb Temple. Now, the Soleb Temple inscription actually says Shasu of Yahu. Now, there is going to be, there is some debate if as to whether or not that is actually Yahweh. I always see that as Y-A-H-O-O. -O. The search engine. <laughs> Yahoo! <laughs> the Shatsu of Yahoo! <laughs> now, the problem with the Shatsu of Yahoo is when you look at the toponym lists, it places the Shasu of Yahu right in the middle of Edom. And the Israelites were never allowed to enter Edom. It was forbidden for them to enter. And they go around it because they're not allowed to enter. So this cannot be Israelites. Even if you do make the case that Yahu is Yahweh. And there's, there's no 
there's there's some good arguments against that actually. So, you know, I don't want to get into those because that's a different topic. But the that's fact a video that, on that's it. a video all on its own. But once you sort of get go down that rabbit trail, and you, I mean, just just the Edom thing is a disqualifier right there. So, you know, that's going to be an issue. Now, after that, he gets into his his secondary reasons why Amenhotep II is king of the Exodus. This is all build up for his his Sinenmu. Yeah, Kosa. we haven't even gotten. Yeah, this is all. This is this is the argument building up to it. Okay, so his secondary reasons was that the successor of Amenhotep II was not the firstborn. Thutmose is the fourth. That is a sufficient, but not necessary criteria. So that's not going to prove Amenhotep II was Pharaoh of the Exodus. Because the fact is, there were many kings of whose firstborn never made it to the throne. Well, why is that even important? Just the fact they didn't die during the Angel of Death? It's important because the Angel of Death killed the firstborn of of Pharaoh. So the successor of whoever the Exodus Pharaoh is has cannot be a firstborn. So it is a criteria. But it's a legal term. Well it is a legal term, yeah. So even with the angel of death, yeah. the holder of the title, Pharaoh's firstborn, mm -hmm. dies. Mm -hmm. But then the next in line that moment becomes the firstborn. Exactly. So the Pharaoh of the Exodus has a firstborn inherit. Yeah. Just because it's a legal title. Yeah. Eventually, yes. It's not the chronologically firstborn yeah. son. Now, here's here's this what, what the negator would be is if a firstborn son was born in ordinal birth survived and made it to the throne. If that in that event you can say then that this person could not be the pharaoh. Exactly. Okay, so that's that's the importance here. Now, the problem is a lot of kings lost their firstborn son prior to their death between disease, famine and war and and frankly early childbirth mortality. Kind of falls under disease to me. Poor living conditions. Yeah, I mean half of half of infants born didn't make it to their second year. Well, we have infants dying in first world countries today. Yeah, with all the advances in medicine and childcare we have. Yeah. Neonatal mortality was super high in the ancient world. It was like fifty percent. Yeah. Half of children did not make it to their second year. There are a lot of societies that don't name their children until they're three. Yeah. But, you know, Thutmose is the third. His firstborn never made it. Amenhotep II, which has already been discussed, didn't make it. The firstborn of Amenhotep III didn't make it to the throne. And the firstborn of Ramses II, his first 12, didn't make it. My goodness. Twelve? Twelve. Merneptah was 13th in line for the throne. Oh, that's true. Yes. You hear 13th in line for the throne, but it doesn't really connect the dots that that meant 12 of them die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was 13th in line. And he never thought he would make the throne. So that's his first secondary criteria, is it's not the first, you know, it has to be a king whose firstborn didn't make it. Okay, that's fine. His second criteria is king that is popularly identified by literalists. So this is an ad populum ar um, argument. Basically, literalists like this, therefore I like this. Well, that's just sort of sort of begging the fact that that literalists don't like reading in historical context. It's like, okay, bad reading methods are your are your popular choice. Is that a good thing? Very few people like putting in the time and effort 
to get an accurate historical context. Well, here's the thing, you know, what's what is the superior reading here? A literal reading or a contextual reading? Well, it's a contextual reading that tells you whether you should take it literally or not. Exactly. Because, yeah, sometimes it is a literal meaning. Sometimes. Sometimes it's poetic. Sometimes it's allegorical. Sometimes it's an idiom. Sometimes it's whatever. Yeah. And you have to know the context. Yeah. And I think that's a big issue here is that by using this ad populum argument, but saying, oh, the vast majority of literalists agree with this reading, that's not a good thing. If you just saw the sentence, 9-11 is still relevant today, mm -hmm. most of us would think culturally in the West, it's referring way back to that nine, that September 11th. Yeah. When the Twin Towers crashed. Yeah. If you work on a help desk, an emergency help desk, you would read it as 911 yeah. is still relevant today. Yeah. Calling 911 for help is still relevant. Yeah. If you're an apartment building manager, you're talking about the ninth floor in the 11th apartment on the ninth floor. Mm -hmm. the context is everything. Everything. The context is everything. You know, and wildly different. I mean, you go to any class on, say, Biblical Hebrew, and, you know, it, it comes out like, okay, how do you know how to translate this? Context? Context is everything. Yeah. Con that's, why, that's why translators always say, context is king. Yeah, we never rule out this could be a literal meaning. What we're saying is you have to examine it to find out. Yeah, context is going to tell you. So... Just because an idea is popular by literalists doesn't make it the superior reading. Yeah, we're both making faces right now. Yeah, kind of. 400 doctors said camels are good for your health. 400 doctors can't be wrong. You know, it's hard to believe those were real commercials. But boy, howdy, were they popular. They were popular. And guess what? 400, 400 doctors were wrong. Were really <laughs> really wrong but it was the consensus opinion smoking was good for you yeah it gave you energy yeah okay the next secondary thing he talks about is the cruelty of amenhotep ii that was so strange you know uh yeah i, I kind of found this to be really incredulous so we really we we dove even deeper and we looked into this i brought it to david's attention he looked into where the source was. Yeah, Pierre de Manolian. Yeah, and this is not mentioned in the article. It can be found in the video. Uh, the actual is on page 24 of the article. Swiftly making a name for himself for his level of sadistic cruelty. And it goes into this strange story on the video yeah. of Amenhotep digging this ditch. And it was first thought to be a boundary to keep prisoners in, but he actually put the prisoners in and lit them on fire. And then he captured the kings and strung them upside down on his ship and then took them back to his palace and nailed them to the walls of his palaces. And I was reading this going, I've never heard of any Egyptian pharaoh doing this. But if he did this, so what? Well, the the point of it is, though, is we looked up his source. Yeah. Because he does mention uh, Der Manuelian or? Manuelian, yeah. Um, by name. And I thought it was a bad sensationalist book. No, that's actually a good source. And that's actually a yeah, really solid source. I ran it by David, and he said exactly that. No, I have the book. It's a good source. It's like, then, then what is this? So David looked it up. And what he found is De Manuelian is citing another author who said this was a speculation made about mm -hmm. these ditches found at a site. Mm -hmm. And the original author says the speculation was pretty much rejected outright. Well, okay, even if it wasn't, even if it wasn't, what we have here, I think, is 
hyperbolizing. Yes. And and we do see this sometimes when it comes to these arguments about Amenhotep II, where there are aspects of his character because they, they want to make paint him out to be at the hard heart of the Exodus king. So they hyperbolize many of the aspects of of Amenhotep. Like, like for example, Titus Kennedy does this. He calls Amenhotep II braggadocious. Basically, that he's doing these things that no claim, king had ever claimed before and no king had claimed since. Like, for example, when Amenhotep II takes an arrow and and shoots through a bronze target. And he says, that no, that's not even possible. And no king ever claimed it. Well, that's not true. Tutmosis III claimed it. King Tut claimed it. Bragging is kind of a requisite. That's <laughs> part of the job, yeah. <laughs> you have to convince the gods you are ultimately the best warrior in the land. It's part of the job. Yeah. It's part of the job to be a good warrior. Yeah. That's part of the job of being king. Protect the food supply. Yeah. That's part and parcel of being it. So there's this whole, there's this hyper, hyper hyperbolizing of the acts of But what, what like for example, like Kennedy will also say sometimes too, oh, you know, Amenhotep the second was this this follower of the vicious god Reshef, vicious kin I got. Well, you know, every king in Egypt followed Montu, who was more vicious. Yeah. But again, vicious won war, so it yeah. wasn't a problem in their eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just what interested me as we dug deep is yeah. we have the actual smoking gun and saw the exact degree this statement was distorted. Yeah. To fit his theory. Yeah, and and that's that's what we're well, that's what we get when when they hyper um, do these hyperbolic statements is they are they are exaggerating how significant and how different it is from other kings of the period. And frankly, Amenhotep II is no different than the other kings of his time. He wasn't this bizarrely cruel. No, he wasn't this bizarrely he was cruel monster. Egyptian man. cruel. He was Egyptian cruel, sure. I mean, it comes out, it seems like every Friday now on your live stream, that Egyptians like to beat people. Yeah. That's not a kind and pacifistic culture. No, it isn't. They didn't go around hugging people. <laughs> um, so yeah, Amenhotep probably was cruel. Yeah. Situations. But he wasn't known yeah. as extraordinarily sadistically cruel. Now, he's got a couple more pieces of secondary evidence here. He says that there's a absence of evidence from the final part of Amenhotep II's reign. The bastards that fall fell upon him. So, you know, there's a lot of kings that we have that that's true for. So, again, that's just an absence of evidence argument. The next one here is... He asked the question, why did Amenhotep II destroy Hepshetsut's monuments? Now, this one, this one's interesting. Because he doesn't get this from Dare Ma uh, Manulian. He gets this one from Douglas Petrovich. It's generally thought in Egypt, in most Egyptological circles, that the defacing of Hepshetsut's monuments was done by Tutmosis III, not by Amenhotep II. And there's no evidence that the, the facing of the monuments took place under Amenhotep II. It's almost, this is, this is something you're going to get from Petrovich, but you're really not going to find in scholarly literature. And then he has one more piece of evidence to support Amenhotep II, the king of the Exodus, which is that the year 23 stela, where he doesn't trust tells the, the viceroy of, of Nubia, don't trust foreigners, don't trust their magicians, don't trust their, their religious people. Now, I think one of the things he doesn't understand here is that Egyptians were incredibly xenophobic. They were known for it. They were incredibly xenophobic. They got a lot of wives mm -hmm. into Egypt. Yeah. But as you've said a number of times... They never gave out their daughters. No. no, they are incredibly xenophobic. So I think what, what Eames has done here is he's taken cosmetic similarities 
the ones that have fed into his confirmation bias. And that's his argument. That there is his argument for the early days of the Exodus. And at that point, he just sort of dismisses Ramses II as, as a potential for Pharaoh of the yeah. Exodus. Doesn't even examine the data and or the arguments. The gentleman from Let the Stone Speak in the video said this turfs out the most popular choice in the culture, that of Ramses. So we just move him along. We don't have to cover him too much. Yeah. And he doesn't cover him at all in the article. Yeah. So it's it's just like, you know, I made my decision. Here's my evidence. We don't need to discuss this. Yeah. And they don't. And they don't. No. They don't refute opposition. They don't refute the opposition. Yeah. Um, Eames also said in the video, it's like a Monet painting. Some of the details are blurry, but if you step back, you see the whole picture. And one of the things that really struck me, because I like Monet, mm -hmm. if you look at his water lily paintings, there's no way you can say it's a painting of a desert. Yeah. Because if some details are clear, you have to accept them as limiters. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to get into now is there are details of Moses, Sananmut, this whole Egyptian yeah. chronology that are clear. Yeah. And just as you can't say Monet's water lilies are a picture of a desert scene. Yeah. Because there's the limiters of it's water, there's lilies. He calls it water lilies. Yeah. There are limiters to the date of the Exodus debate. Mm hmm that you have to accept as a limiter. All those toponyms that he doesn't even broach. Does not even broach and doesn't even understand. By the way, that's minute 1302 in the video. Okay. For the Monet painting. Well, we are going to now skip over. Now we've, we've covered, this is his base argument. This is the base argument that the Senamut moses connection is based on. So we have thoroughly refuted his base argument, okay? There's the, I don't think there's any reason that, that this can stand. I mean, nobody accepts a high chronology anymore, except early Exodus people, and then only a distorted one. The people in the pews don't know that. No. Scholars know that. Yeah. Old Testament scholars know that. Egyptologists certainly know that. Yeah. But we're doing this because the person in the pew who gets really excited... Yeah. That there's something called Let the Stone Speak. Yeah. They don't know this. No, they don't, which is why we're going through it. So we've covered his foundation. Now let's let's talk about some of the details here that we did not cover in the original Sinenmut video that we found looking at his Sinenmut video and sort of picked up also from... And yes, we're going much longer than our standard 20 minutes because this guy packs in so much. Yeah, he does. Now, the first thing I want to address is something he said in his video at 9 minutes and 58 seconds. So he says, A no-name was elevated to the very highest levels of Princeton, and he is made crown prince. That was very unusual. So... I had to look it up. Where did he get this from? So I went back to his article. It's like, wow, this is strange. So I found it on page 25. And it's a quote from Roberts and Ward. Now, we're going to go into who Roberts and Ward are, but let's just read the quote. And the quote says, This originally non-royal individual stunningly came to be, quote, granted nearly 90 titles bestowed on him by Hatshepsut, including Hereditary Crown Prince of Egypt, Count, Sole Companion, Master of All People, Chief of the Whole Land, Royal Vizier, and Chief Royal Architect. And we'll go into what all those mean in a moment. But he gets this from Roberts and Ward, page 134. Now, Let's talk about who this source is. We, we mentioned this source briefly 
in the last video as the investigative journalist. But we actually finally looked up this guy. And it's worse than an investigative journalist. So, his... Uh, By the way, the, the source and the page number are not mentioned. Yes, yes, the source and the page number... Footnote. Yeah, yeah. Eames does not footnote here, and he should. But I managed to look it up. And the book is called The Exodus Reality by Scott Allen Roberts and John Richard Ward. Okay. Now, the first thing that really sort of struck me odd was the endorsements, the recommendations. Every book has endorsements and recommendations on it. Oh, dear, that's this part. Oh, yeah, that's this part. <laughs> oh, hang on to your hats, peeps. This is, this is crazy. Okay. Now, um, the first one is from Chevalier, which means knight in French. Knight Paul Grant, who is Knight Grand Cross of the Temple of Jerusalem. Grand Prior and Master of the Knights Templar of England. <laughs> who is this guy? That's I'll tell you who this guy is. Cool, but not really a relevant source. These are, this is, this is a guy who claims to be, okay, this is a guy who claims to be a Knight Templar. He, he walks around in a robe <laughs> and claims to be a Knight Templar. <laughs> His claims have been widely disputed, okay? So so this guy's a fantasist. Including by the Catholic Church. To wipe out. <laughs> yeah, including by the Catholic Church that claimed to wipe out the Templars. But, but, but he's essentially a fantasist, okay? Now, the second recommendation is by Micah Hanks, author of The UFO Singularity. <laughs> Oh, and what has that to do with the Exodus? I don't know what that has to do with the Exodus. And and frankly, I read the look like, uh, let me read the let me read the recommendation. It says, in looking back on the riddles of our ancient past, we are often faced with a number of challenges in our future. One of the greatest among those challenges we face today is finding common ground in a world a culture of growing diversity, both intellectually and otherwise. But at the forefront of the mystery, John Ward and Scott Roberts have managed to pool their ideas and differences on this enduring subject and are looking to the ancient riddle of Moses and the Exodus with modern clarity that will likely provide, prove to be unmatched for decades to come. Really? Did he somehow claim that aliens abducted Moses? Uh, we just missed it? I, I, I don't know why somebody would even be... Okay, the next one here is Maria Nielsen, who is a PhD classical archaeologist, project uh, director at Gibel El Cecila. Now, she is... A credible source. credible source. And you would ask, well, you would wonder, okay, why is somebody like this writing a recommendation for a book like this? Then you find out that one of the authors happens to be one of her surveyors. So it's a personal favor. Ah. It's a personal favor. Either way, she's not a pharaonic archaeologist. She's a classicist. So she's an archaeologist of the classical era. And her specialty is Hellenistic Egypt. But the strongest name there. But she is the strongest name on the recommendations. The next recommendation is done by Jane um, Akshar who's the author of Hidden Luxor and Luxor News. Now, who's Jane Askar? She is... Up her, um, she is a... She's a web designer and does internet marketing. She's now retired. So, okay, that that's fine. What is her education? Because, you know, you look at her education, she's got a LinkedIn account where she shows everything she, she's done. And you look at her education, and she's got some big names on it until you discover what this is. I mean, she's got the University of Leicester. Okay. And then you see this abbreviation, M-O-O-C. Massively Online Course. Oh, my word. 
and it's all through her 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 CV here. University of Leicester, M O O C. University of Warwick, M O O C. Emory University, M O O C. University of Manchester, Certificate of Continuing Education. That's her highest credential. Now, night I, courses. Popular night courses is what that yeah. is. Yeah. Now, I think online education is a lot of fun. Sure. I mean, I've taken some just to learn the subject. Yeah. But that not... But these are the people who are supposed to lend credibility of your book by recommending it. Yeah. So you've got a fantasist, a Templar fantasist. You've got a, a UFO conspiracy author. I don't get that connection. You've got one real archaeologist. You've got a dilettante. And then the final one, which is Dan Madsen. Writer, editor, publisher of Star Wars, Star Trek, and Lord of the Rings official magazines. Now that's cool. It's cool, yeah. What does this have to do with the Exodus in archaeology? He likes a good story. <laughs> he likes a good story, yes. <laughs> that's about the only thing. But then you get to... You get to about the authors. Okay, so we're going to talk about the authors here. Again, we're just part of evaluating sources. Okay, so now we, the two authors here. Hey, anything to do with Star Wars, old Star Wars, original Star Wars, it's legitimate. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> that gives automatic street cred. <laughs> automatic street cred. <laughs> uh, Scotty Roberts is the founder and publisher of Intrepid Magazine a journal dedicated to politics, science, culture, UFOlogy, mm. unexplained phenomena, alternate fringe theories, and world mysteries. He is a accomplished illustrator and designer. He also writes good stories. He attended Bible College and Theological Seminary. Okay. He is the author of Rise and Fall of the Nephilim, the Untold Story of Fallen Angels, Giants on the Earth and Their Extraterrestrial Origins, The Secret History of the Reptilians, The Pervasive Presence of, of the Serpent in Human History, Religion, and Alien Mythos. All right, so, that's, so he doesn't have any academic credentials. He's basically a... I don't know if he'd be hired by the National Enquirer. Oh, I think I think the National Enquirer would eat this stuff up. Uh, John Ward is said to be an archaeologist, anthropologist, explorer, and author. Uh, but doesn't give any of his. He's a member of the Gebel El Sosia Survey Project, so he's the friend of. He's the friend of Nielsen. Yeah. Okay. He also is currently researching many mysteries surrounds medieval Templarism, and. Possible connectivity through symbolism to ancient Egyptian antiquity. That might have been the connection to the Templar. It could be the connection to the Templar, too. Yeah. So, but, but the thing I think is missing about these authors is what's, what credentials that they have that give this work credibility. And I think that's a real problem. Because when you look at, say, the... The bibliography for their for their book, it's only four pages long. But this, what the problem is when you look at his bibliography too. You know, it's it's got some good works in it. It's got some, some bad stuff in it, like Budge. Yeah, I know we, some books, like the bibliography is one third of the book. Yeah, two thirds is the text, but yeah. one third is where he they has got it he from. has the bi bibliography for three versions of the Bible. And the Talmud, it's not a great bibliography. But what's even worse is when we talk about that quote, which was from page 134 of, of the book, the one we're talking about here that, that Eames cites. Okay? So we go to that, and... And again, this is... 133. It's 133. This is relevant because Eames basically has two primary sources. Yeah. This book and Petrovich's. He's got three sources. Petrovich, Krasto, and Robertson Ward. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, the problem is when you look at this quote from, from Robertson Ward, it's not cited. It's not cited. So all those, those, those titles that they're quoting here, there's no source. You can't go back and look this up. It, it's no source. Okay, so now let's talk about the actual titles. Because there's problems with these titles. Like, for example, the Hereditary Crown Prince of Egypt. And this is a, this is a claim that Eames repeats. Repeats yeah. this claim. That's, that's a central part. That's a central part of the argument. claim. There is no evidence that Senenmut was ever made Crown Prince. Zero. In fact, the highest ranking title that we can verify that Semenmup had is called the Imira Pair Ware, which is the great overseer of the house. Chief bean counter for the pharaohs. <laughs> Chief bean really? counter for the pharaohs. <laughs> yeah. So if you if we're talking here about the hierarchy of Egyptian government. At the very top, you have the pharaoh, have the king, and beside him can be the crown prince. Okay. Directly underneath him is vizier. Now it also says in this here that he was also royal vizier. We have no evidence that Semenu was ever made royal vizier. You said we have three named viziers. Two named viziers two for named. Hatshepsut. Okay. Uh, one of them is Amenth, also called Amosa, and Usur Amen. So it wasn't that we have no names of viziers. No. Her viziers are named. Her viziers are named and known. And he's not one of them. He's not one of them. Okay, so so under the pharaoh, you've got the vizier. And then under the vizier, and there are usually two viziers in the New Kingdom. One for Upper Egypt, one for Lower Egypt. Yeah, and so a third one would be... So, and then underneath the two viziers is the treasurer. Because money's important. Because money's always important. Okay. <laughs> it's good to be king, but it's better to have the purse strings. It is better to have the purse strings, exactly. And then underneath the treasurer is the great overseer of the house. So he's in effect not in the top He's like fourth or fifth place in the kingdom. So it's, it's, it's an overstatement here to say that he was crown prince or even vizier. And it's not supported by the evidence. This is a claim by a low quality source. A really low quality source. And this is why sources matter. And this is why, you know, I just saw a meme on it that emotions don't influence data. Yeah. But data should influence emotions. Yeah. Eames is in love with his story. Yes. And it really comes out in the videos. Sources matter. And this is one particular case where the source here really betrays Eames. He's used a low-quality source that doesn't cite their sources, and he's run with it without checking it. But again, if this was an adopted son... Of a woman who was just daughter of a king, but now she's become king. We'll get to that. All right, so... We're, we're not done with this yet. All right, we're getting there. We're going to get there. All right. But wait, there's but more. Wait, there's more. Uh, later on, he also says... Uh, it makes a statement, too, in the video, that Tutmosis I did not produce a fully royal son but a half-royal son called Tutmosis II. That's like being a little bit pregnant. Yeah, that's like being a little bit pregnant, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
It's not the way royally works. Yeah, either are royal or you're not. Exactly. So he weaves the story of Hapshetsu being forced, or Tutmosis II being forced to marry his sister Hapshetsu, his fully royal sister, so that they, he could establish the throne. He could take the throne. Not the way it works. The way the line of succession works in Egypt is there's no such thing as half royalty. Okay? You were either son of the great queen. Sons of the great queen inherit first. If there's no sons of the great queen. Then a son of a minor queen inherits. And if there's no son of a minor queen, then the viziers and generals fight it out. Okay? So in this particular case, well, something else is going or on Or the vizier here. sends the popular general off. <laughs> <laughs> While he steals the throne, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have, not that we've ever heard of that happening before. <laughs> King I. <laughs> Politically, that was a brilliant move. It was a very brilliant move. <laughs> Get your competition out of the country while you steal the throne. <laughs> well, he thinks he's going to eliminate the competition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so what we got here is that Tutmosis I had only one son. Tutmosis II. You have a succession crisis in potential here. So what's happening is that Moses II is being forced to marry Hapshetsut as a form of sympathetic magic. Mm -hmm. You double up the bloodline to try to bring stronger offspring, offspring because it was thought that you two sets of royals getting together and having a baby would lead to stronger offspring. It's, it's a magical world view. It's wrong, but it's a magical world view. This is the same reason why King Tut was married to Ankh-Sunamun. Yes. His half-sister. You want to do reason. the exact opposite. Yeah, you want to do the exact Blood opposite. Lines, royal bloodlines, European bloodlines, got much healthier when the crown prince said, no, I'm in love with a commoner. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to marry her. Yeah. And you get brand new bloodlines in. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Genetic diversity equals stronger genetics. Yeah. So, but that's what's happening here is Tutmosis II is being forced to marry Hapshetsu to produce stronger offspring. On a complete side note, it's so funny how many European royals are related to Vlad the Impaler. <laughs> we won't get into that, but yeah, it is funny. <laughs> so that's what's happening here. It's not to claim the throne. Tutmosis II already has the throne by right. He doesn't need that. Claim it. It's really sympathetic magic. So that's the that's the that's one of the things. The second thing he another thing he says is that Senenut had an unusual name. And the name here, Senenut, is brother of of a mother. And he claims that this was given to him by Hapshetsut to make him like family. But then he wouldn't be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. The brother of the mother? He just, yeah. Yes. And he wouldn't be the son of the queen. Yep. He'd be brother of the queen. Yep. And again, that would pretty much mean he could do whatever he wanted. Mm -hmm. So his whole argument, I don't see why he makes it, because it completely disqualifies us from being Moses. If Moses was even the son of the queen, who was now king, but the brother, he could go out and slaughter pretty much whoever he wanted and get away with it, and no one would say boo. But the whole brother of a mother thing, these are not uncommon names in Egypt. The fact is that we have these often theophoric names. Now, it could have been that it wasn't brother of the mother, but the moot goddess. Ah, like son of Ra. It's like son of Ra. Brother of 
brother of the goddess Moot. Yeah. It might have originally been a Theophoric name that got misspelled. So that's, that's a possibility here. Because we do find this. We find, for example, names like um, uh, Senen Montu, brother of Montu. We find a name that's called Senet uh, Amet, or sister, in that case, sister of an Asiatic. Okay, So we do have this in, uh, like, you can look these up in Ronka. These are not, un these, these sort of relationship names that don't exactly tell you the relationship are fairly common in Egypt. So just because he's called brother of the mother doesn't mean that there's an actual relationship there. And moreover, this also, there's nothing here to suggest that Hepshetsut gave this name. Nothing at all. Yeah, he, he never claimed it. Yeah, it's, it's empty conjecture. Yeah. It's empty conjecture. Okay, we just got two more here, and then we're done. Okay, second to last, he says, Commoners could not touch royal children. Where did he get that? That's such an absurd idea. Yeah, that is a completely absurd idea. I mean, you, you had, what, alien nannies? <laughs> well, the way, the way it worked in Egypt with, with royal children, okay, it depends who, who gave birth to the child. Now, if it was the great queen who gave birth to the child, the child would be taken away from the mother and given to royal nurses to raise. Okay? If it was, a say, a minor queen, then the child was given back to the minor queen to raise. In some ways, it was better to be a minor queen. Yeah, in some ways, it was better to be a minor queen. But for, for the great queen, her children were taken away and raised by the royal nurse. Because they were to inherit the throne. Okay? And it's a pretty safe bet that no matter what level of queen was raising the kid, they did not clean the diapers. They did not clean the diapers, no. Pretty safe to say that was a perk of being queen as you had somebody else yeah. doing that job. Yeah. So, basically, from the time of the birth of the child, and remember, childbirth in Egypt involved midwives. 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 Okay, so not the catcher. For <laughs> catcher. <days later. laughs> yeah, I mean, if commoners couldn't touch that baby's in the floor head <laughs> first, then that would explain a lot. The way the way that um, childbirth was done in Egypt was the the pregnant woman would stand on a pair of birthing bricks. Yeah, and you'd have two midwives. One would clap with ivory clappers to keep the woman in time, her breathing in time. And the second midnight wife was her job was to catch the baby as it came out. So, a ch royal child, a royal baby, would have his, her, his or her first human contact with the midwife catching the baby. They, did, they didn't just let the baby hit the floor. The pregnant woman didn't have to lean over and try and <laughs> do it all herself. Yeah, yeah, the baby didn't hit the floor. Because uh, <laughs> it would create a mess. I mean, I guess if that was the rule, you could have the woman standing over a trough basket, and yeah, the they kid didn't do could that. They didn't just do that. slide out and slide down. <laughs> well, the baby's coming down head first. Yeah. You have to support the head. Generally a good idea. Yeah. So you're not going to let even let it fall into a basket. That's not the way it yeah. works. I mean, like we said, some of these you actually have to be. An Egyptologist, a subject matter expert, yeah. to know this is wrong. Yeah. But some of these, everybody should listen to this and go, yeah, right, where'd you get that whacked idea? Yeah. Of the... course, commoners mm -hmm. interacted regularly and physically interacted regularly. Wet nurses were hired. Yeah. Wet nurses were hired to feed the royal child. Plus, they interacted with other commoners. Because generally, the wet nurse had her own baby. Yeah. And then you had the royal nurse, who was the governess, yeah. who basically cleaned the child, clothed the child. Disciplined the disciplined child. Disciplined the child. Yes, yeah. even that too. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, they had to be... sit time out in corners. Oh, no, no, no. They were disciplined to behave as royals. Yeah. So this whole idea that, that 
commoners didn't touch the royal children is nonsense. It's utter nonsense. Now, in the case of Senenmut, his statues are very interesting because he does feature the crown princess, Neferu Rey, as being seated on his lap. Now, that is a familiarity in statuary that's uncommon. We don't see that very much. So that's very unusual. So especially for someone of his particular position, which was as the great overseer of the house. He was more of a sort of a tutor and guide than, and maybe maybe he did even have that sort of, of governance position. So he's kind of Uncle Senny. Yeah, he's Uncle Senny, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if, if he and was, it, that would be something to brag about. And it would even make sense of the name, too. Brother of the Mother. Brother of the Mother. Yeah. So, without there being an adoption kind of position. Yeah, an actual status of he's become like family. Yeah, he's become like family, but he's not family. And Shetsu's actual daughter mm -hmm. has adopted him in the way kids adopt people. Yeah. Oh, you're my favorite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's not a formal adoption as such. And there's really no evidence to show that Sunenmut was ever adopted. There's no, there's no evidence, even all the evidence we have from the burials of him, relatives, are not like Moses in any way. And for those who don't know, Sanenmut's parents, their tomb was found and excavated, mm -hmm. and all the evidence there would say otherwise. Well, here's what I think is, is so interesting about this, too, is that in the case of, say, um... Ramosa, which was Senenmut's father, he lived to about 62. We have his body. We know how long he lived. He lived to about 62. But the Bible says Amran, who was the father of Moses, lived to 137. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Are they going to claim that Ramosa lived to 137? Because they've taken... They're taking that, they're, they're doing that Western numerical primacy hermeneutic. Yeah. Are they going to be consistent with that hermeneutic? Or they, are they going to just throw it out too because it's now inconvenient? Yeah. Because the fact is, Eames claims that Ramosa is Amran. Yeah, he just changed the name to an Egyptian name. Yeah, he just changed the name to an Egyptian name. So if that's the case, then the real, say, the Ramosa father of Senenmut, should be 137, not 62. But there's a pro another problem with the tomb, mm -hmm. that six additional unnamed bodies were found in the two coffins of the parents. Mm -hmm. And they're assumed to be close relatives. Yeah. But Senenmut had written a list yeah. of his brothers and sisters. Yes, he did. And the name Miriam never appears on it. No, it doesn't. In addition, a contradiction is the Bible names two siblings. Yeah. The brother and the sister of Moses, yeah. not six. Yeah. yeah. So the, the two Muslim names three brothers and two sisters. So you wonder why he's bringing this up if the actual evidence contradicts his story confirmation bias so you think they just can't see i think they don't want to see but it smacks you in the face when you read it it does yes it does smack you in the face when you read it but they that's found the, thing. the tomb of sanet moot's mother and father and even have the name of his grandmother yeah i mean they're there's... all from the city of her hermonthus None of this matches. None of this matches the biblical Moses. At all. Mm -mm. I mean, he says throughout the articles and the uh, videos of all of this. Yeah. You know, the parallels are so obvious. No. No, they're not. No, they're not obvious. And, and they're have, not a good match. You have to really stretch and distort 
what data is there yeah to to make even the vegas connection yeah oh yeah and he's got to do a lot of stretching here yeah this is again the problem with cosmetic similarities it feeds into confirmation bias i just thought of a new term for it yoga research yoga research stretch then to start really stretch then way over backward okay and now there's one other last detail he keeps bringing up that we found at the end of the rabbit hole here which i am going to let you basically go off on here because i think it was a brilliant point which is that Eames kept stating that Senenut was, quote, the rise of a nobody, end quote. But if he's adopted son of the daughter of a king, he wasn't a nobody. No, from being a toddler, mm -hmm. uh, from being an infant, yeah. not even a toddler. From the time he was old enough to be set in the basket, Moses would have been national somebody. Mm-hmm. He would have been a full member of the royal court. And so his rise, if he was Senat Moot, nobody would have blinked an eye. Mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't have been a rise. It would have been the natural progression. Yeah, this is not like the situation it would have been with a late Exodus date. Because with a late Exodus date, the woman who adopt would have adopted Moses wasn't yet the daughter of a queen. He was okay. the daughter of a general. He was the daughter of a vizier. So so that was a retrojective yeah. title. But, but in this particular dating and case, it would have had to have been, Sinenmut would have had to have been adopted by a royal. And that's another flaw in making Sinenmut Moses. Mm -hmm. Because the daughter of an actual king at that time could not adopt exactly the daughter of a king was one of the very few women who wasn't qualified because it affected inheritance yes yes now the case for the late date rests on that that you have a woman who's able to adopt Yes. Who is not yet the daughter of the king. Yes. She adopts a baby. It completely gets around that problem. It's a done deal. And then she becomes the daughter of the king. Mm -hmm. In which case, that Moses is not particularly a hotshot. No. He, he's a royal. Yes. As, as we said, there are no half royals. There's no half royals. He's a full royal, which gets him the ability to go talk to Pharaoh when he needs to. Yeah. But he's not particularly special. No. He's not the crown prince. Not the crown prince. If you're the crown prince... And the Bible never makes the claim that Moses was a prince. That's a really important thing. Yeah, that's a Western addition. Yeah, that's a we, Western we interpretation. We interpolate if you are adopted by the daughter of a king you become a crown prince yeah and it's like no adopted children were, were ineligible for the throne yeah one of the things about being an adopted child of the king is you are ineligible for the throne yeah you the fact is that moses was described as being the adopted son of a daughter of the king not son of the king what sons didn't count for much so the current king got knocked off. And then you ranked where your dad is now. Well, I mean, grandsons from an aunt were not eligible. They weren't eligible. I'm sure the British royal family has experienced a lot of that. Well, the British royal family does allow for that. But in the case of, say, Egyptian, um, uh, basically succession, the succession is always the same. Sons of the great queen... Sons of the minor queens, well, and viziers and generals. Anybody else? You had so many, the great queens, the lesser queens, 
And there was so much infighting just mm-hmm. there. Yeah. You know. But that's lesser how... son of an aunt. That yeah, yeah a son, an adopted son is not in the line of succession. Yeah. The son of a daughter of a previous king isn't in the line of succession. They're just not in the line of succession. They would never be eligible to be crown prince. Yeah. The only reason why you had say crown princes that weren't royal was because the king himself wasn't royal. Well, this let me give you an example is Horemheb. When he's made king, he's not a royal. He's a commoner. He's a military man. He's the high general. The line, the Theban line of kings was dead. Tutankhamun was the last Theban king. He died. I took the throne. Who is vaguely related to Amenhotep I, but he was not royal. It doesn't make you royal. Okay, so I dies. Horemheb, who's from the Delta, the Nile Delta, he's, he's a commoner. He's a full-on commoner. He becomes king. Who does he make as his crown prince? He doesn't have any kids. He makes Ramses the first. General Ramses, another commoner crown prince. That's the only time you get crown princes that aren't royal. Is when the previous king wasn't royal. In the case of Hapshetsut, she had made Neferu Rey her successor. And she wouldn't have done that if she had had this favored son. Mm-hmm. The problem, too, at, with, with her making her crown princess is that Tutmosis III was still alive. And he was also king. And he was the rightful king. And Hepshetsu has a way of just insisting her version of reality. Mm-hmm. Whereas if she had this son, Mm -hmm. and one of the things I've heard you explain several times is that adoption outranked biology. So if somebody was adopted, their adopted parents became the parent. Yeah. So in in the case of Moses, the woman who adopted him he would have grown up thinking this was his mother. Yes. Although he might have known because she was involved in his life. She was the... Uh, nurse. Wet nurse. Yeah. Wet nurse and probably the caretaker. Yeah. Like those royal nurses. You know, the ones that supposedly can't touch. <laughs> can't touch royal children. That's just such a strange thought. <laughs> I mean, did the person who came up with that never have children or take care of anybody else? I don't think that they've thought this thing through. But it doesn't take much thought. No. I mean, you read that and you just snort. It's like, yeah, you've never changed a diaper. Yeah, I know. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's, as I said, I don't think they thought this through. And I think that Christopher Eames did not think through this in high, entire thing. He... He fell, he in, fell love. in love with... This Ro- is a, a murder mystery, yeah. and it's Sinet Moot. This is the, the, the solution to the, the murder. He fell in love with the theory of Roberts and Ward. Yeah. And at, once he fell in love with it, the, love, the heart loves what the heart will love, and it can't be persuaded otherwise. And this is the difference between a popularizer and an actual academic. Mm -hmm. Because if you're an academic, you are supposed to give your theories at conferences first, and your fellow academics will eat you alive and tell you of (laughs) every flaw you make. And they're doing this as a favor to you, so you don't go popular and make an idiot of yourself. Yeah. Now, I did notice that, uh, you know, Roberts, was war- who was a student of Charles Ayling, uh, probably a, one of his, his bachelor students, Charles Ayling. Now, Charles Ayling is, wow, uh, he was an early date advocate. He was also an Egyptologist. He was also really incompetent. 
Now, and most people don't know that name. And I mean, he he's now retired. Good, thank goodness. Um, but he was not a competent Egyptologist. Um, his work was not very good. I mean, I looked at some of his work in the past and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe he published this. Uh, like he did, uh, Alien did a famous paper on basically trying to argue for a 15th century Ramses and couldn't tell the difference between Ramses and Ramosa. Just, oh, that's why I know the name. Yeah, that's why you know the name. Uh, he's also famous for a disastrous debate he had with James Hoffmeyer. He had a disastrous debate against him. Uh, Hoffmeyer had him for lunch. One of the things Ailing told Roberts was, you better be careful with this Senemut theory because it's too romantic, too fabulous. Yes. And I thought to myself, wow, Ailing actually gave you a piece of really good advice here, which you kind of just blew off. Yeah. No, I'll, we, I'll we, we've recently lost Alan Millard, mm -hmm. and he was a really good friend because David would send him his articles, and Alan would rip them to shreds. Yeah, and it and it always did me good. Yeah, it always did me good. Alan have... never hesitated to say, "I'm not convinced." Yeah, you haven't made your point. Yeah. So I think Roberts was given some very sound advice by Charles Ailing, and he just ignored it. Yeah. And I think that was tragic because Roberts then doubled down on his Sinenmut theory without properly citing his sources, and then Eames doubled down on it again using a source that was a low-quality source. And I, I could easily pick that up in the video that Eames is really enthralled with this idea. Yeah, he's really enthralled with this idea. And I like that it's too romantic. It's too romantic, yeah. Yeah. He As I said, it was really sound advice. Yeah. And it was ignored. Yeah. It was ignored. But this is where, say, if you go down the yellow brick road, you'll end up at the Emerald Castle. Yeah, people don't realize that you and I read each other's papers, mm -hmm. and we try to be nice, but being nice and being kind isn't the goal. No, it's not the goal. We critique each other's papers. Yeah. Because I'd rather you find out and point out my errors than I get up at a conference, mm -hmm. and that audience critiques it. And they're pointing out the errors before it's published. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the people we've critiqued are people like this, mm -hmm. who make something very popular. Yeah. And it hasn't withstood academic scrutiny. Yeah. And I think that's a really good note to end on here. Okay. So, so there you have it. That's our Man Machine Alert where we talk about the whole sort of structure of Christopher Eames' Senemut equals Moses theory, okay? So we've, we've gone over all the foundational material. We've gone through his thought processes here, and I just don't think this theory holds water. Okay, just plain old, and I think my producer here agrees with me that this thing does not hold water. Absolutely. Okay, so anyway, I hope you learned something in today's video. We want to thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible.